Welcome to the Traditional Bow Hunting and Wilderness Podcast. This is Jason Sam Kobiak. I don't know what episode we're on, but uh, today's topic is going to be becoming a student of the woods. This is an important one. We're going to talk about what it takes uh, to really consistently be able to get into animals, kill animals, um, and uh, and how you get to be that kind of a person and what it takes to make that stuff happen. And uh, before we do, we're going to mention a couple things here for you. One being a uh, uh, product or company or something like that that I believe in. And uh, we're going to talk about Northern Mist Bows for a second. Obviously, a lot of you guys know about them, and I won't keep it, uh, I won't make it very long. But if you are looking for a new bow, and you're looking for a longbow specifically because he doesn't make recurves. But if you're looking to get into a longbow, you should definitely be checking out Northern Mist Longbows. Steve builds amazing bows. I do not get paid to promote his bows. I've been shooting them now for about six years. Uh, I have my third classic, which is my fifth Northern Mist bow in six years. Is My third classic style, uh, hill style ASL bow, is on order right now. I should have that probably this summer sometime. And, uh, and But he builds incredible bows. And, but I don't get any kickbacks. I don't get any discounts. I actually pay him probably more than any of you guys ever do because I also firmly believe, um, if you listen to my other podcast where I talk about tipping people and things like that, um, you know, I tip him. He is one of my great friends and uh, I hunt with him a lot, spend a lot of time with him, talk to him all the time. And, and I got a lot of great respect for him and who he is as a boyer and what he does. And I will not take any free bows from him, even though they've been offered or in exchange for help me helping him with website stuff. I don't, I don't take anything from him him for free i pay not only full price i also pay i tip him a couple hundred dollars on every single bow and uh and it's because like i said i have mad respect for his skills and what he does as a boyer and who he is as a person so before anybody jumps on me saying hey you know you're promoting him because you're getting him free no i'm not i sh- i recommend him because his bows are the best bows i've ever shot in my life and if you're looking for a long bow um especially a hill style bow man you just can't beat that i mean if you look at forums like trad gang and stuff i haven't been on there in many years probably five years since i've been on there i don't have time for forums anymore but if you're on there they used to have threads on hill style bows that were hundreds of pages long and uh the vast majority of the bows on there were were steve Teres hill style bows um and uh he built some of the best ones ever made I'm, i can't say enough good things about him uh since i've switched from an r&d style bow to a hill style bow my um my track record of of you know watching animals fall down when i shoot them in perfect absolute perfect hits has gone through the roof and uh, it's just such a forgiving style and it like i said i love his boats i'm on my way right now to uh the kalamazoo show the expo down there and uh, i'm gonna stop in and see steve there um but i'm telling you Northern Miss Longbow is one of the best bows I've ever shot in my life, and I can't recommend them enough. The fit and finish is flawless. The attention to detail is incredible. The way he fine-tunes it with the formulas to make sure that that bow is built exactly for you, your draw length, your shooting style, and everything you do is just incredible. And the guy's just a perfectionist. And, and everything about the magic he puts into him is straight-up legit. I'm not lying. So if you're looking for a new longbow, check out northernmistlongbows.com. Now, another thing here, too, remember, you guys, there is the bow hunting whitetails course, and as I told you, I think, a week or two ago, I am not raising the price on it, uh, not for any foreseeable future, uh, because of the fact that my Save Thousands course, it teaches you how to save money on all your new cars, uh, trucks, boats, campers, RVs, snowmobiles, dirt bikes, four-wheelers, whatever you're buying, um, that course is doing so well too that it's made up for and paying for the extra that I was going to charge in a, in a bow hunting whitetails course. So that course is still available. Uh, the bow hunting whitetails course, like I said, it's been out now for about a year and a half or a year. I think I launched it last year in April, and I want to say there's uh, there's like seven, eight, nine hundred of you guys in that thing. That course is just pure power, and it's I see everybody that comes into it by name. So I see, and I'll tell you what, it is such a humbling and, and powerful experience to see some of the huge name people that I have in that course that have bought that course some of the big names in in bow hunting and it's just like no way I can't believe he bought my course and it's pretty it makes me pretty proud I'm pretty excited um but there's some it, it's going very well but the bow hunting course is staying at the seventy four ninety nine. it is available I still do add to it regularly even though I haven't added anything in the last uh two or three weeks 
I just been super busy with everything, but I do. I got a lot of video that'll still be putting in there. And when you buy that course, you get all of my new content for free that I add in there. Uh, the course has doubled in size over the year, well, over the last, less than a year. April will be a year, but since April, it went from uh, being like seven hours long to now being something like uh, 16 hours long. It is everything you could ever dream of. The info is there for you. Uh, that's that bow hunting whitetails course. And then my Save Thousands course. That one, like I said, that one is off the charts insane if you want to, if you're going to be buying any new big purchase. It will teach you how to not just save a couple thousand dollars. It will teach you to save 20, 30, 40% on these things. And when you're talking about a $20,000 truck and you can, you know, you can save, you know, 7,000 bucks off of it, you're talking about a $40,000 truck and you can save 12, $13,000 off that. Um, that's pretty impressive. I mean, that's insane. Or, uh, you know, I mean, even my, my Renegade that I bought this year, you know, that Jeep Renegade, I got $26,459. So basically, I call it a 26, but a 27, almost $27,000 sticker price on that thing. And uh, I got it out the door for 16800 you know. So do the, do the math on that. That's tremendous savings. Um, so pretty, you know, there's a lot of great info in it for you that'll teach you. So if you're looking to buy something new, check that out. But remember, the Save Thousands course is set up on a, uh, a, flu- uh, a fluctuating or a rising uh, cost factor due to the fact that I'm not letting more than 500 of these courses be sold for protection from too many people doing it. That one, the first 200 people get it for 99 bucks. Okay, and right now I think we're at about 70 people in there right now. So just keep that in mind. Um, but uh, it's not going to move as fast as a bull hunting course, obviously, because there's a lot of people that aren't buying new stuff. But uh, if you're buying something new, like I said, the first 200 get it for 99 bucks. People that come in at spots 200 through 400 are going to pay double that for 200 bucks. And then people, the last 100 that come in are going to pay 300 bucks or 250. I'll decide that when I get there and we'll see. But, um, but it is on a floating or revolving uh, payment set up there. Again, because I don't want that many people to have it. I'll be completely fine if only 250 people take that course. I will have no problem with that because I don't want too many to have it. It's just too powerful. Uh, and I don't want that to come back where it doesn't work for us to have it to be able to use that, that technology and information to make it happen. So those are there, both those courses available at tbwpodcast.com. And then you'll see the Bow Hunting Whitetails course right there, and you'll see the Save Thousands course. tbwpodcast.com stands for Traditional Bow Hunting and Wilderness Podcast. Now, one more exciting thing that I want to put out there for you guys, and the reason I'm putting it out there, it, it's very personal, and I really shouldn't, and probably, you know, I, I probably shouldn't, but. I know a lot of you guys love my self-sustainability and my, uh, you know, my motivational podcasts I do for you guys and things like that. I mean, they're some of the biggest ones that people listen to. And um, so I just got done doing my taxes, okay? Now, keep in mind, it's been a year and a half. It was June, not this June that just passed, not June of, of 19, but it was June of 2018 on my way, on my way to uh, Canada for a bear hunt that I broke down. And on that, on that drive... I spent 4000 bucks to buy a uh, course online that would teach me how to sell things on, uh, you know, how to get into the digital world, how to uh, market things, uh, e-commerce and all that stuff, including like Amazon and uh, a lot of that stuff. I spent $4,000 on a course to do that. Four grand. Okay. It was huge. Well, and then in the first uh, first eight months of that, I lost twelve thousand more dollars. So I was down quite a bit here. What I lost is I was trying to do that. Well, it's been a year and a half since June, then two thousand and eighteen when I've done that, and I just got my ten ninety nines. I mean, I was trying to ballpark it throughout the year. I think I talked about it a little bit in one of the past episodes as I was trying to ballpark the numbers based on on what I was seeing. But I just got my ten ninety nines from YouTube. I got my 1099s from Amazon. I got my 1099s from PayPal. I got them for my uh, podcast stuff. I got them from the courses. I got them from everything. Um, So I have all my 1099s to show how much money they paid me this year. And now before deductions, my gross income that I made from not my not from or from my not photography stuff. I'm a photographer, so I do for a living. I run a photography company with eight people. um, And that's my main source. I've been doing that for 23 years now. Um, but in a year and a half since I started this, well, you know, I started that stuff, the extracurricular online, uh, 
trying to make money, laptop lifestyle. I've done podcasts on it. Many of you guys have followed this. Well, this year in 2019, we made $97,000 gross income. That's what my 1099s add up to, $97,000 in money from side jobs and doing this stuff on my own, you know, the, the non-photography stuff. Um, that's, that's pretty hardcore. That's very, very hardcore. Now, keep in mind, more than half of that is Amazon. But, uh, you know, some, I think it was like 58000 was Amazon. And, uh, but when you, and now, when you take in my deductions for products that I had to buy, uh, you take in my write-offs and everything I get to write off. For, I wrote off all my hunting trips. I write off every piece of hunting equipment I buy, every piece that I review. I write off my gas to my hunting trips. I write off every tag I get. I write off everything hunting-related now. And when you take all that stuff into consideration, um, I'm able to knock that down. It, it ends up coming in at about uh, about twenty seven thousand uh, dollars after all my write offs of that stuff is is what it. Or I'm sorry, thirty seven thousand dollars is what it came in as actual um, income that I made this year from that stuff net, like in my pocket net. But again, keep in mind a lot of that write off that came out of that between that thirty seven thousand and that hundred thousand is stuff that I'm I enjoy doing. That's what the beauty of having a a outdoor related business is is all the stuff i enjoy doing i get i get to write off my bows i get to write off my arrows my broadheads my hunting trips my food while i'm out there hunting my you know all that kind of stuff gets to be tax deducted all my tags my 600 hundred dollar kansas tags i get to write that off my you know all all this stuff so keep that in mind that it's stuff i'd have been buying anyway but i'm incredibly proud of that it was a lot of hard work a brutal exhausting endeavor to get there a lot of ups and downs and a lot of crashes along the way and like i said at one time i was twelve thousand dollars in a hole going what in the hell was i thinking and then you just kept piling through it and kept turning around and well in order to do that as it relates to this podcast we're going to talk about today the whole thing same with hunting is it starts off with you thinking you know something because you learn something but then when you dive in you have to really you really start opening these nesting dolls you really start developing this toolbox full of tricks tactics information and all this stuff and you really start applying it and you learn from those mistakes but those mistakes that losing that twelve thousand dollars which is included in there i made the 97 on top of losing that twelve thousand okay i mean so when you put this stuff into there um you really start uh, learning this and you become a student of it and you really can take advantage of what this information is out there and how to apply it and every time you make that mistake it the mistakes are way more powerful than somebody showing you hey do this and telling you don't do that okay the don't do that teach you so much more and the podcast we're going to get into today is going to cover all that and how to be a student of the woods so that you can get to a point of successfully killing animals all the time consistently and just and be be at that level of being able to do that. We're going to talk about what it takes to get there and teach you how to follow that path to make it happen. But my story of this extracurricular money and this laptop lifestyle and this entrepreneurship um, is a great example of that. You know, in, in, in a year and a half, I went from spending $4,000 with a bead of sweat dripping down my head as I put that on my debit card, going, man, I can't believe I'm doing this. I can't believe I'm dumping $4,000 for a course that's going to try and teach me how to make money. And I did it. And then to be frustrated and swearing and throwing things around because you're losing money and you have all these problems that come up and you end up, you're, you're 12 grand in a hole on something and, and you're fed up to turning it around and getting to a point where it's making you gross of $100,000 a year. And uh, it's, it's my side job. It's my secondary thing. It's my uh, working on a Saturday morning for most people kind of thing. And it's able to do this. And it's it's pretty interesting um, that the process that went through that. And that was actually what made me stop and think about it and relate it to how it is for hunting. And so that was the whole purpose of driving this actual episode. What you know To look at it and identify it and, and put this together... That plus the fact that I, uh, you know, I was just down in, in Georgia and I did a uh, hog hunt down there on public land and I stalked in and killed a hog at 20 or at 15 yards. But I mean, I did that stalk across dry oak leaves, 
heavily corn, you know, cornflake type woods, and uh, I managed to get within 15 yards of that pig and killed that pig perfectly with one shot from, you know, one hard shot with an arrow. Um, but I mean, it's. There, there, I remember when I was doing it, it took me probably 25 minutes to complete that stalk in on that pig from when I first heard the pig um, until I was able to get into 15 yards for a shot. And I would have shot her 20, but I couldn't because of the thickness of the Paul Meadows and River Cane and stuff that was there. But it was just so loud and horrible, crunchy, that I the whole time there were so many things that were going through my head. And so many times I had to tap into that toolbox and that resource of files that I have that are just based on experiences that I've learned in order to get me to that point. And then I did it with my wife a few more times. We did that throughout the, you know, we were there for two and a half days. And, uh, or actually, was it one, two, yeah, two and a half days we hunted down there. And uh, I got my wife into eight different pigs inside of 30 yards. She was going to use her 22 mag because um, that was a caliber she had to use down there. Um, for her rifle, but uh, we were going to get her, you know, we were able to get her into 30, 35 yards, eight different pigs on eight different occasions, but uh, we were not able for her to seal the deal just because of, uh, you know, there are two of us and hard and uh, making too much noise or, you know, we couldn't keep up with them because we couldn't move as fast as they could or uh, they just came by and it disappeared or we jumped one and he took off too quick and she couldn't get a beat on him through the thickness or, you know, these kind of variables that come into play, but I cannot tell you how many times on that two and a half days of hunting that I had to literally dive deep into bags of tricks, into the the hidden archives of hunting knowledge, of past experiences, of things gone wrong, of all this stuff to make this work and have it happen. And I thought it would make for a perfect podcast. So that's our goal today. We're going to dive into it deep and cover it. But as you can see, not only does this stuff help you in the woods, it also helps you in real life. It can help you if you start with any business adventures that you get into. The sky's the limit and the skills that you learn and how you decipher what's good and bad and even on the, the most horrible mistakes you make or failures you have, if you can extract the positive and the lessons and the learning experiences out of those and file them into that file folder of valuable info, then you, you're way ahead of the game and you're moving in the right direction. And that's what we're going to talk about today. All right, so we're going to go ahead and get into the show and cover this in detail. Now, what does it take to become a student of the woods? Well, unlike other things, okay, I mean, there's a lot of other things that you can do that you can um, read a book and get smart at it. You can buy a piece of gear or gizmo, even in hunting, that's going to make you a little better. A compound bow will let you shoot farther than a traditional bow. Crossbow will let you shoot farther than that. Gun will let you shoot farther so you can, you know, you don't have to be so precise. There's a lot of things that let you, you know, that, that really cheat the system. But with a traditional bow, you don't have a luxury of cheating the system. You cannot beat the learning curve. It has to happen, and you have to become a student of the woods in order to be successful. There is no two ways about it because of the limitations of our equipment. But so what What, what does it take? What, what, what's, the, what's the end goal? Well, the end goal is to be able to get in close enough to kill deer or, or whatever animal you're hunting on a regular basis. But there's such a process to that. Let's look at it this way. Let's, let's look at the end result. A lot of people think of the end result as, oh, I just got to get where deer are. Okay, well, that's not true. Okay, let's just take that for example. Okay, yes, you got to get where the deer are. And you got to hunt where the deer are, right? Okay, well, sounds simple enough. But that's that's that alone in itself is a big one. But then even after that, it's not just getting where the deer are. That might work for modern hunters. But for traditional bow hunters, not only do you have to get where the deer are, you have to then be in a position in that area where the deer are going to walk by you within a 20-yard range. Then you have to be in a spot where they're going to walk by you within 20 yards and not wind you. Then you have to also make sure that spot's to where you're within 20 yards. They're not going to wind you and they're not going to see you. And you have to get within that 20 yards where they're not going to wind you, not going to see you, and you're going to be able to draw and execute a shot without getting picked off or busted in the tree by your movement. And you're going to have to be in a spot in that tree that's going to give you the right place where you can actually make a shot on that animal and get a double lung hit and a good vital hit, not be too high, where you're going to get one lung hits, things like that, not have variables uh, that are going to mess that up. 
then you're also going to have to do all of that plus have it where when he walks by you he is going to give you a broadside or a quartering away shot not a quartering two you have to pay attention to that stuff and how they're going to walk through the funnel or pinch point or whatever you're on so that they're not facing at you or going to give not give you a good shot and you have to make sure you set your stand up on the right side of the tree to accommodate all of this stuff. And you have to be in the right mental mindset to be able to execute that shot with no mechanical advantages such as sight pins, release aids, draw stops, uh, let off, all these variables. Or heaven forbid a scope on a crossbow and all this kind of stuff. You need to be able to do this 100% mentally and you need to pull it all off. Okay, So you can see there's about 25 or 30 variables more than just get in where the deer are. So you make all of these things happen, including getting where the deer are or whatever animal you're hunting. It is a series of experiences gained, good and bad, that teach you how to pull this off, how to make each one of these steps happen, how to unravel or, or open up each one of those nesting dolls till you get to that final inside one, which is you putting the arrow, th arrow through the vitals of an animal and then finding it dead on the ground. Because that's another one. Not only do you have to shoot the animal and execute it cleanly and perfectly, you then have to have the, the skills to recover that animal. And, you know, it, it, the list goes on and on. So there's so many variables to this. The only way to develop that to a point where it's not just dumb luck or one good shot, but where you're doing it consistently, that requires you becoming a student of the woods on every single level. So how do we take that from the beginning? Let's take it through those phases. Now, when you start scouting, and again, we're sticking with deer because that's what most of us are interested in here for this, but it applies to any animal. But... Like, for example, I always say in my courses and in things like that, and I've told you guys before, start scouting with cyber scouting to get you in the right area. In the course, I teach you how to do that and how to make that happen and what you're looking for. Now, once you get out in that place and you get that and you start putting boots on the ground to verify this stuff, now is when you have to become that student. You have to really stop what you're doing. The second you close your car door and you're about ready to head in there to scout or hunt or whatever you're doing, you have to stop and take a couple of deep breaths and tell yourself you are now in the woods and not in the real world. You know, my wife laughs because she says, you know what, there's only two times that you ever shut up and stop talking. She's like, all you do is talk all the time, nonstop, blah, 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 and I love it. But you know what, when you drive, you're always thinking and your, your head is lost in something and your brain's working and you don't talk a lot when you're driving. And she says, the other one is when you get in the woods. The second you get in the woods, your mouth is just zip shut and you say nothing and you just take it all in. That's the key and you need to do that because in everyday life, we are focused on an end point, okay? Drive from point A home to point B work. Drive from point A work to B point B home. Go to the mall, walk it, or grocery store, get what's on your list, get out. Everything is a planned determination. When you hit the woods, you need to stop, take a couple of breaths, and realize that you are now on a different level, and you are on a different timetable. And it is your job to slow down, smell the roses, take it all in, and explore and realize it, okay? What I mean by that is you can't, you, you have to, I actually did a podcast maybe four or five years ago called The How and Why. And that stuff, the how and why is what matters, okay? So many people, I watch them when they're in the woods, and they look down and go, oh, look, there's a deer track, and they keep right on walking, okay? Well, you can't do that. That taught you nothing. That said there's a deer there. Okay, now when we start walking a little further and they get past it, I'll stop them and say, hey, which way was that deer going? Oh, uh, it was going to the left because his track was pointing to the left. Okay, good call. Why was he going to the left? Well, I don't know. I only saw the one track. But the one track was a, of that scenario, that situation, the track was the first nesting doll. What if you could have got five dolls deep in that and learned? You know, uncovered five more clues. Yes, the track was pointing to the left. Well, what's to the left? Oh, look, over there. We got a lot of oaks over there. Look at the top, look at the top of the terrain and what's over there. Okay, turn your head the other way. What's over to the right? Uh, why would they be coming through there? Is it thicker? Is it an edge? Is there a transition line there? What's happening? Maybe even step off that trail where that is and or off that track that you found on that power line or whatever and then head into the woods and see what the trails show you and take a minute and analyze it and try and figure it out. And Who knows what you might find? That's being a student of the woods. Most people say, oh, look, there's a deer track, and they keep right on moving. They learn nothing from it. If you want to get good at this stuff, you have got to become 
a student of the woods, a student of the animals. You have to let them teach you. You have to ask the how and the why in order to understand it. So many people, they, uh, you know, up here in Michigan, we get snow in the wintertime. Well, if we get snow, they get in their car and they drive around and they look for where deer are crossing. Okay, crossing roads and stuff like that. Great, no big deal. I totally get it. Let them see something. Not once when I drive through there and I see all these car tracks through the snow, do I ever see footprints following deer tracks. Never. I don't see them ever except for one or mine, which I do all the time, even this time of year now. Um, you know, when I get out in the woods, I want to see what these deer are doing. So if I see a deer, if I see three times, three sets of deer tracks crossing the road, I want to know why. And now I already know why, and I see this stuff, but if I see uh, 10 different sets of deer tracks cross a, a road on a corner or something, with, or within a 50-yard within a area, I know that they got to be coming from somewhere. There is some kind of a funnel back in there. You think I'm just going to drive by that and go, huh, that's interesting, look at that. No, I'm going to park my car or truck, whatever I'm in. I'm getting out and I'm hiking in there and I'm following those. And I want to find where they merge and I want to find where they come together. And what is funneling those deer? How are they coming through here? Why are they coming through here? And how can I benefit from it? What can it teach me? And you would be amazed what you learn. Because a lot of times funnels in those kind of scenarios, they're used all year long. Okay, It's not just winter time only. Now a lot of stuff in the winter is winter only, summer, summer only. But terrain features that move deer are usually year round for some one reason or another and they're worth finding. Okay, That's being a student of the woods. It's not simply driving by it and going, huh, look at all the deer that crossed here. It's going, wait. Why are all these deer crossing here? How are they coming together and how can I hunt them? And, and why is this? Why, why is bedding over here? Why is feed over here? What can I do with it? And it's putting as many nesting dolls taken out of this as you can get. Putting as many clues together as you can. And, it, and maybe you might not even want to hunt that spot. But as you're walking it, you're going to learn more. So you don't just get out and go, okay, and then start storm trooping through the woods. And go, okay, i got to just find a spot where all five trails come together and then set up a stand. Yes, you can do that. But you're skipping out on what you could be learning. That's like the Cliff Nose version. That's like your uncle going, hey, here's a good spot, sit here. But what if you were to look at those tracks and go, well, okay, why are they narrowing down to here? What makes this the funnel? What is it? Is it a hard edge? Is it a transition? Is it open stuff on both sides? Is it a way to cross over water? Is it a, a low spot where they have cover? Is there some sort of a wind tunnel going on here? And then you can figure out why. And then the next question as you head back to your car is, why did they separate? Why do I have five different trails instead of one coming through here? What is it? Oh, look here. We have two micro transition lines through here and when they want to head this way they're going on that one they want to go on this one they go that way well where do they go then walk back out you cross the road you go oh look these ones are heading over here they're going to run this transition line or i wonder if they're going to break to the left over here further and they just knew they were going to do that oh look they are it's interesting they knew which route they wanted to go so they separated back here 250 yards back at that when they came out of that pinch point to make a change 250 yards further down. Interesting, you know, and you can see the terrain they follow through it. It's becoming a student of the woods, and then you'll use that stuff. See, all of that knowledge you gain gets filed away in your mind, and you don't even know it's in there very well, but you, you've paid attention to it, so you've actually almost said it out loud, noticed it, went, huh, and it's stored, and now it's there. And now, next time you come into the woods and there's no snow on the ground and you got a funnel out of there and a pinch point out of there um, and you go to hunt it and you're seeing these different trails, you can realize maybe what they're doing. Hey, look, these guys are going this way for this reason. I'll bet they're breaking off somewhere over here to the left. So they're already starting that gradual uh, transition to the left and following this micro transition. Well, if I pull up my map, I can see over here that to the left, there's a... a a cornfield or a bean field out there or a oak flat that's dropping acorns uh, but to the right where this other trails would be going there's not much down over there so they're they might be going to bedding but if they're going to the left they could be going to that food that's over there so if i sit in this funnel there's good odds that because it's uh it's afternoon right now that they're going to be coming out of that bedding area and coming through here or they'll be coming from bedding on this side and heading up to that food over there as they go through this funnel so i want to make sure that my wind 
does not blow to the right where they could be coming out of that bedding area. Okay, this is a safe hunt for this wind direction. See how that works? Because you've tapped into that because you've seen it happen other places. And you understood that they're going to make that transition not as a hard 90 degree turn when they get there off of one trail, but they'll start that, trans that, that transition coming out of that funnel to whichever direction they're going. You learned it. That's being a student of the woods. Another perfect example. I've killed four deer in my life this way in Missouri. And uh, so you look at this and you go, all right, the rules, classic rules state, you know, again, rules of deer hunting that people know. Deer, when they cross the water, they're going to look for a low spot on the bank so they don't have to jump up and down the high banks and the steep banks. They're going to look for a low spot that's easier for them to walk down that bank, get into the water, and away up on the other side that's not too steep and pretty easy. Okay, classic, simple river crossing or creek crossing funnels. Classic, written everywhere, it's been known forever. Okay, what if I told you that there's times that it's not where they're going to go at? And it, I've killed four deer because I did not sit in that kind of a funnel, even though the trails were there. But instead, I went somewhere else because of the fact that the river water dropped down. Okay, When a river water dropped down, you would think, oh, well, that would make that steeper bank even harder, and they won't use that. To an extent, yes, but when you've seen them and you've spent enough time sitting at river crossings and low water or i mean where that low spot is and uh and then all of a sudden the deer aren't doing that and you watch them jump off of a 10 foot cliff right into the water and then hip scotch your way up the other side and, and you know pogo stick their way up there you're going why are they there when they should be right here and then you look down and you start doing your how and why and analyze it and you realize that because the river has dropped down three feet then what you have is you have a 15-foot section, 20-foot section of that bank at that low spot that now is super deep, soggy, wet mud. And those deer don't want to fight and get stuck and have to pluck their legs up and down out of that, you know, two-foot uh, deep mud hole that they're in in order for them to get through that low spot on there because now it's a big mud pit. Instead, they'd rather drop off that high, hard ground bank right into the river, cross it, and then jump up out of there on the other side and not have to fight, you know, 15, 20 feet of mud on each side of that and deal with it. Interesting. You don't learn that unless you're a student of the woods. You learn that by making the mistake of sitting in those places, which are great funnels, when the water's high and it's not all mudded out, not a pain in the butt for them to get through, but once that water recedes, now they're going to the spots that you would not normally think they would go into because it's easier walking for them. It's easier. Deer take path of least resistance. It's a simpler uh, way to go. Things that you don't learn unless you're out there and experiencing it. Becoming a student, and like I said, that requires you to ask the how and why of everything. You climb up in a tree on a low spot in a river with a good trail and it looks great and there's some deer tracks there, even a couple deer tracks that go through the mud and you're like, these are fresh, this is a spot, here we go, I'm game on and you set up in there and then 10 deer move by on both sides of you jumping off of high banks. Some people go, oh, that sucks, I was in the wrong spot, huh, that's a bummer and then they don't go there. Okay, and that's it. Or they move out. Or maybe they just move over there and they're like, huh, this time they were over there. But if you're not asking the how and the why and putting it together and understanding, you're not learning that stuff. So then next year or next week or even in a different state, you get there and you find that low spot. And you're like, oh, but look at all that mud. See all this mud? The river's low. This is pure mud. Those deer aren't going to be here. They're going to be over here. They're going to come right off this point. And your buddy's going to go. Well, no, all the sign is in that low spot. There's no, there's no really no deer sign here whatsoever. I don't, I don't know why you would sit here. You need to be 50 yards further down there. And you go, well, you know, I'm, this is where I'm going to sit at because of that mud hole. I don't trust it. And then you're going to kill a nice big 10 point and he's going to be sitting there in that and he's going to just watch deer jump around on both sides of him and not come through there. These are things that you learn through experience by being in the woods. And there's no other way to learn them unless you are a student of the woods paying attention to what the animals what the terrain what the topography what the wind direction what the wind travel through the topography what all of these things do and you cannot learn it overnight you can read it in a book and it can teach you some things but tell you get it firsthand and understand it you're not going to know it people tell you all the time never hunt in the bottoms the wind swirls it's going to screw you up it's going to ruin it 
may be fine and dandy, but what if I tell you that there's places you can hunt down there where you can channel the wind right down a draw, right where you want it, and keep, you know, so you're only ruining uh, 25% of this, and you got sign everywhere in them, and coming, they're coming up and down the, the valley, they're coming off the fingers on the other side and crossing over, and you have access to everything except for about 20-25% of that where your wind is going, and if that wind happens to be put where you want it, and you're in the right tree for it, that's an incredible place to hunt. Okay, it's, you don't learn that until you've been down there and you've been in the bottom and you watched the wind swirl and you knew how it was screwing you up and then you said, you know what, I can't take this. It's not going to work for me. i got to get down and move. But I'm staying in this bottom. Where can I move that the wind blowing this direction is going to put it in a box that I can store that wind and not have it be an issue for me? Where can I put it into a net that is not going to be a big deal and it's not going to swirl and screw me over? Oh, look at that. If I throw it down there and I set up in this tree and it spits that wind down that draw right over there, I'm probably safe for anything coming here, 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 here. Boom. Unhook your your uh, uh, tether, lock that lineman belt, pull your stuff down a tree, move over there, reset up, good, get in position, get ready. Now all of a sudden deer are coming by you because you're not blowing out the whole valley. These are things that you learn by being a student of the woods and asking how and why. Always asking questions to yourself. Always analyzing. Why is this here? Oh, look at these deer tracks. That looks like a good track. Hey, man, was that a buck or a doe? Well, I don't know. Well, you could know if you go back and look at it. Well, how would I know? Well, you can look at it. Were the tracks one right in front of the other uh, in a single line? Or were the back or were the front shoulders uh, wider? Were those tracks staggered? Were they stepping like the, the back foot com- or the back foot comes up and steps on the inside toe of the front foot? Well, I don't know. Well, let's go back and look. Oh, look, it's staggered like that. You got a back foot coming up and stepping right where the front foot was, but it's off to the inside of that. Guess what that's telling you? Now we most likely have a buck because the girth of the chest on a, on a buck is usually wider than the back end is where a doe is pretty much even front shoulders and rear hips. And she's going to walk in a single file line with her tracks. But a buck has got a wider chest, especially the bigger they get, and he's going to stagger that front feet are going to be outside of that inside hip foot that's going to step forward then you can tell what that deer was okay you learn this by being a student of the woods by having a deer walk by you that's a buck you can learn this in a book too but you learn it by watching a deer walk by you and then you get down and you look at their tracks you go huh why is that offset okay this is how and why learning letting the woods teach you stuff listen to it observe it Pay attention to it. It will teach you more stuff than you could ever dream of if you just stop and slow down and ask the how and why and ask as many questions as you can. Gain that knowledge, store that knowledge, and be able to pluck it out of your files whenever you need it to be able to use it at a future date. Now, also, a lot of the stuff you're going to learn, you're going to learn through your own mistakes and failures, but they're going to, you, you have to absorb the knowledge gained from those and learn those. I'll give you a good example of that. Me and John, we were in Missouri hunting. We're talking 12, 15 years ago. We were on uh, on a leased part down there, you know, um, uh, with Curtis and Trina. I've talked about them before. Uh, down there, Herefordale Ranch, they got leased properties down there. They still do today. They're great. I have them on my website page if you want to look into a Missouri hunt down there. They're fantastic people. Uh, but we were hunting with them down here. Well, they have a couple of cabins all set up kind of wagon style where people can hunt the different properties, but they all camp in one area in these Amish built cabins that they have in this one general, you know, six, eight cabins in one spot. And we came back in from hunting one day and there was a bunch of guys getting ready to go out and look for deer. And, uh, well, we met them at their thing and we were talking to them about it and stuff. And they were, uh, getting ready to go out and the guy had his arrow from him killing that deer and they were all looking at that arrow and the one guy there the kind of the the guy that was the most experienced he's like oh that's great you know we'll give him two hours we'll go out there and get him in two hours and i was standing there and and john looked at me he he kind of looked at me like oh jesus and i I said hey let me see that arrow you know i looked at that arrow and i said you know what this is 100 percent gut shot i would i would definitely give this deer probably eight nine hours before i go after it this guy's like no you don't have to do that i've killed 60 deer I, I know what, what, you know, we got blood there. See that blood right there? And I asked him, I said, how many of those deer were gut shot? He said, I've never gut shot an animal. I use a rifle and I got my compound. I've never made a bad hit on an animal and never had to worry about it. So I, I can find them. If there's blood, I can trail it down. 
I said, well, we have got a lot of experience between us and friends and on tracking gutshot animals. And we've lost a few by jumping them too early. And looking at that right there, you have no oxygen in the blood whatsoever on there. It's dark blood, meaning muscular. And you got a lot of slime and bile on that arrow, meaning it's a gutshot animal and you can smell it. And I'm telling you, you get out there, you're going to, in two hours, you're going to push that animal and you're never going to find it again. You want to go with him and you guys want to go poking around out there and screw it up, go ahead. But your odds of recovery are slim. If you want to wait it out, then uh, me and John will go out there with you tonight at about one o'clock in the morning and we'll help you find that deer and at the very least we'll at least locate where that deer is and you can come back at daylight oh uh, how are you going to locate that deer how are you going to find him in the middle of the night well because at night his eyes are going to shine then he's going to be too lethargic if he's not dead already he'll be too lethargic to be able to get up and run and he'll let us get within 30 40 yards of him uh before he moves because he just doesn't want to move because he's sick and tired and uh he will actually will spot his eyes and we can mark him on a gps come back and then you can come back two hours later and he'll be laying there dead that's stuff that you would never know unless you've had to make those mistakes. If you've accidentally made gut shot hits and were forced to learn this stuff through experience. And that's what we did. And we knew it. And those guys did exactly what we said. And we went out there with him and it went exactly as we planned and exactly as we, we I told him it would. And we saw that deer pop its head up and we saw its eyes and they marked it on a GPS. And we turned around and we backed out of there. We went back and got some sleep. Those guys went back out at first light, found that deer laying right there dead, perfect as can be. And if he wouldn't have been, uh, you know, if, a, if he wouldn't have, uh, if they would have went out there earlier, they, after two hours, they probably would have jumped that deer. And where that deer was in that thick CRP he was in, the odds of them finding him would have been probably pretty slim because you could tell when he took pictures of that deer where it was at that uh there was there was not much blood in that bed so he was not bleeding much it was clogged up from something so these are things that you learn by observation by experiences by having it happen same with the tree stands i did a video uh a year or two about it which direction to face your tree stand as a traditional bow hunter and i said you want the deer to come from behind you I had so many people. You don't know what you're talking about. That's the dumbest thing I ever heard. I don't want to sit there and have my head cocked backwards looking over my shoulder the whole time I'm in a tree. I need to see him coming. Yeah, if you're a modern hunter, more power to you. Compound guys can come to full draw for minutes before that deer gets there. And all they have to do is just touch a release. Traditional guys have to draw and shoot all in one pretty quick motion while the animal is inside of that zone right there. And also, if you become a student of the woods, you learn that, okay, if it's pouring rain, you might want to risk it and face that stand forward so that you can see him coming because you're not going to hear him. But if you're in the woods where it's dry leaves, you're going to hear him for a while. It's better to have him come behind you. If you're on water in a swamp and you're going to, you're going to hear them slucking through the mud as they come up behind you you don't need to be facing the way the deer are set yourself up for the better shot these are things you learn by becoming a student of the woods paying attention to this stuff i didn't come up with that by accident i didn't just one day say oh it's better to face my stand away from the deer no it came from getting busted trying to draw and shoot them when they're coming to me or broadside right next to me where they can still see me um, before they get away from me and me trying to do that and having deer then snort and run off at, at Mach 4 as they take off out of there because they busted me trying to draw on them. Eventually, when you ask yourself the how and why, you realize they are busting me because I am facing to them. If I spin my stand on the other side of the tree, let them walk by me, and then as soon as I can't see that eye, I get a perfect quarter and away shot, and I can take them right out of the game, and I don't got to worry about shoulder blades. I don't got to worry about any of that kind of stuff, and even if I'm back a little too far, not only do I get gut, which slows them down, I still get one lung, which is going to help kill them quicker, and even on a bad hit, they're going down pretty quick, and I'm going to find them. I get a way better odds of recovery on that quartering away shot, which you learn. You learn that from experiences, good and bad. And you learn from good and bad which way to hang your stand on a tree. You learn all of this stuff by being a good student of the woods. Oaks are another great example. Cracks me up every time. I have people, I have friends, well, friends and neighbors that are around me that have been, you know, they're in their 60s and they've been hunting their entire life. And, you know, I'll watch them and be like, oh, the oaks, you know, you got to hunt where the oaks are. Well, and I'll ask them and say, well, what oaks are you setting up on? Are you sure, you know, you're on the right oaks? Well, it's an oak. It's an acorn. Eight deer eight acorns. That's where you got to be at. You know what? You would think after spending 40 or 50 years in the woods, 
you would have somehow asked yourself the question of what oaks, what acorns, what trees are producing, why that they want to eat them, when do they eat them. I mean, these things are things that you learn pretty quick. I did a video last year on understanding the difference between white and red oaks. And I explained why they eat them, when they eat them, how they eat them, what order they eat them, what they need to happen to them before they'll eat them, all these different things about them. And it was pretty interesting. And thank God a lot of people watch that video. Thousands of people did, which is good because some of my best videos where I will teach you stuff that blows your mind get very few people watching. They'll get like 500 people to watch it. It's like, really, really? Yet uh, that, and then, but on the same note, I'll have 50,000 people watch a video on why I carry two, two two by fours in the back of my truck. But I put out a video that's just absolutely amazing. And, and like I said, you get 500 people that watch it. So it cracks me up on some of that stuff sometimes. But if on that video, thank God so many people did. Because you can learn so much. That's not something that's, that's stuff that you learn when you're in there. You ask yourself the questions. Well, why does this, this one tree have a ton of deer tracks, a lot of deer poop, and no acorns under it except for caps. But this tree, 10 yards away, has got hundreds of acorns under it, no tracks, and no poop. What is going on here? This doesn't make any sense. Then you get online, or at the time when I learned it, you got into a book in an encyclopedia and started learning it. So before I left there, I pick up the leaves, and you pick up the acorns, and you take in, you take pictures of the tree on your camera, and then you get there, and you get home, and you look it up, and you see what they are, and you realize this is a white oak. These are hit first. Well, then you ask yourself, okay, well, so they're not touching the red oaks, but why, why are these other ones that are red oaks, but when will they eat those? You start reading about them, learning about the tannic acids, learning about how they got to leach out, learning about this stuff. Why? Because I have to know the how and why. This is important. Then you learn that white oaks are the first ones to get hit because the second they hit the ground, they're sweet and perfect and deer eat them up like a vacuum cleaner. Red oaks have to hit the ground and they have to bleach or leach, actually is the correct word. They have to leach out their tannic acids through rain and through washings and through dryings with the sun and over and over again of that for a few weeks before they lose that tannic acid and become palatable for a deer or anything to eat them. And that's what has to happen. So they save the, the red oaks, which is designed by Mother Nature, I'm assuming, so that they have a good mass crop of acorns to be able to sustain them later in the year when they need them the most. And they're not all ate up by everything out there. So they focus on the whites first. Then they hit the reds after the whites are all gone and the tannic acids have leached out. These are things that you don't just know. You have to learn. Now you find this stuff on internet. You find it on courses that I've done. You find it on videos that people put out there. You find this information that way. But we had to learn that stuff by knowledge and curiosity and then research. Okay, But that stuff has taught me how to get the answers I need and that I need answers. I just went down and hunted in uh, down here in Georgia. I don't know the trees of Georgia. Yeah, I know a pine and I know cypress and I know an oak, but I don't know what these oaks are down there. I don't know the difference between a live oak and a water oak and, a, you know, and a, uh, some of these other ones and pin oaks and some of the things they got down there. But you can bet that I took pictures of every one of these kind of trees and the acorns. And it, as soon now I just got back, you know, yesterday and today I was at the expo. So it's not like I could solve that yet, but you bet your butt. I'm going to research this before I get back down there. So I understand what these trees are and what they do and how, how the animals use them. And I'm going to, uh, and I got pictures of plants that I saw where pigs were rooting in the areas they were rooting in. And some of it was obvious because it was just grass, but other areas were obvious because of acorns, but other areas, what are they, what is the aquatic stuff here they're eating? What are they rooting for? I need to know that. Okay. I learned that I did not see as much pig sign in areas that had heavy pine than I did in areas that had more oak. And it was still fresh signed, and I thought the acorns would have been gone by now, but I was still finding little ones there. So these are things that, you again, you become a student of the woods. Ask the how and why. Pay attention to everything going on around you, what the situations are, why they're here. You know, all of this stuff matters. Why is why is a deer trail a night deer trail versus a daytime deer trail? Why are they on this side of the transition line and in the thick stuff here, but over here they come into the more open woods and follow the transition there? Why, why, why? The more of these that you can put into your, your file cabinet of information and you can tap into the better off it is. When I was stalking that pig, trying to, I, I got to within 15 yards of that pig, and I had choices with every footstep I made. 
where I was, I was right on the edge. I could have stepped in the mud line of where the water was, but now receded a few feet back. Or I could have stepped on the dry oak leaves that were crackling. I had to make that decision. Because I didn't know the depth of that mud because I hadn't been in it yet. I was afraid that if I stepped in it and I sunk down into it a little bit, it would be make a <laughs> sucking sound like that when I went to pull my foot out, which would have gave me away and blew it and I would have been busted. Instead, I chose to walk on those leaves. Why? Because I also knew how to walk on those leaves. I knew, and, and you hear people all the time, oh, start with the heel, light pressure on the heel, roll the foot forward, blah, blah, blah. Well, I learned a long time ago that doesn't work for crap. Instead, what I do is different. I use my whole foot in one step, and I set it there, and I set it very slowly, constantly applying five more pounds of pressure, five more pounds of pressure, just slowly collapsing those leaves under my feet, and it's dead quiet and silent. And then I'm also, as I'm doing that, I can feel as I'm pushing down if I'm going to snap a stick or if anything's there, but I don't have to commit to my heel, or I don't have to commit to my toe fully. I can put that whole foot down very slowly and very controlled as I do it and that's what I did and I did that and I was able to walk on dry oak leaves to within 15 yards of a rooting pig and be able to kill that animal okay that stuff doesn't happen without you having that experience that experience only comes from you learning it and the only way you learn it is by being in the woods doing it these are all valuable valuable things that you learn you have to become a student of the woods now what happens is all of these things start to accumulate and that, that file that you have gets bigger and bigger with every outdoor experience if you are paying attention and asking the questions all the time. If you're not, you're not putting anything in that file cabinet. So as long as you're filling that file on every single experience, building that toolbox of stuff up, understanding this, breaking down those nesting dolls to get the answers that you need, and you're going through this process, every time you're out there, you are becoming a better student the woods is teaching you and you're receptive to learning from it and then what happens is you start killing animals and you start using these things and so all these variables that come into play that we talked about earlier you already have the answers to these questions and when they're faced with them and you start asking them you can you know fall back to that file cabinet of past experiences knowledge gained and, and, and skills developed and use those to your advantage in the moment and you can do it super fast and you can use that and that's the consistency of being able to kill deer on a regular basis is is having that resource available to you to knock out each of these little variable one at a time as they come through that's what makes for a good hunter a good woodsman a good outdoorsman it's all based on becoming a student of the woods learning from it and saving that stuff and keeping that experience available when i killed that pig i was 2.7 miles from the truck from where I walked at. And it's 2.7 miles to where my frame pack was that I needed to get that pig boned out and out of the woods. So I walked that two point, I killed that pig, marked it on my GPS, and I went that 2.7 miles back to the truck. And when I got to the truck, now I had a decision to make. Well, I went and got that pig. I got it all done well. When I got back to the trailer, my wife didn't hunt that day. When I got back to our camper, she was asking a lot of questions about that because I came back soaking wet from basically the crotch down. I was soaked. My boots were soaked. My rubber boots were full, you know, were soaked. My socks were, my thermal, everything about me was soaked from basically the crotch down. And she's like, I, j just explain this to me. How did you, wh what made you choose to go that route? I mean, how did you uh, do all this stuff? And wh why did you go that route versus coming back to the truck to go the same way back that was dry? To, I'm just curious what, what, what your thought process on this. And I said, you know, it's pretty interesting when you actually stop and think about it. When I explained it to her, I said it out loud. And by saying it out loud, I kind of gave myself a, huh. It's amazing how that stuff happens or subconsciously and you weigh the options. But what had happened is I went back to my truck, 2.7 miles. When I got to my truck, I had a choice to make. I looked on the map first on my GPS and I'm like, is there any other roadway or anything that will get me closer to where that hog is from where I was? I know I crossed over another trail that was down there. I see it on the map. This one will get me there, but we actually had been down that road yesterday, and there's a section of that road that was basically 250 yards of, of super deep water 
you know, from that river flooding and that swamp going right, the road's gone. There's no road there. And uh, I'm like, but you know what? I'll bet it's probably not any more than waist deep. Maybe I should go check that because that'll cut off 1.5 miles of that trip, make it 1.2 miles. For So now instead of having to walk back another 2.7 to the pig with my frame and then boning out that pig and walking 2.7 back to my truck. So you're talking almost five and a half miles of hiking for me to get that pig out of the woods. I could drive over to this other area, get down to where that water is, cross that water, and be to that pig and back to my truck in only two and a half miles. So literally cutting off half my distance, but I have to cross the water. Well, crossing the water, I got a couple options. I can take my, my pants off, my boots off, all of that kind of stuff. But you know what? Given the fact that it could be waist deep, I'll probably be in, still end up getting wet somewhere. Uh, or I'm looking at it going, okay, it's 38 degrees right now out here. I know I've been wet before and had soakers before. I know that I can get that pig done, get to it, get it done, get it processed, boned out in my pack and be back to my truck in under two hours. And in two hours at 38 degrees, I know I'll be completely fine. My boots are rubber. They're going to insulate that water that's in there for my body heat and it'll warm that water quick, even when I drain the water out, but for my wet socks and stuff. So I'll be okay there. Uh, all I got to do is I'll take my thermals off and then I'll be in fast drying pants still dry quick and won't be a problem uh, I'm going to go the water route and that's what I did drove my truck around got there took my thermal bottoms off left my pants on put my wallet in my backpack had my phone in my mouth I walked through that water that was crotch deep with my boots on I could have took my boots and stuff off too but I'm like I don't know what the bottom of this is like under here and I can't see nothing under there and I, I'm not walking barefoot through here I'm just not doing it and uh, so I left everything on and I hiked all the way through that water. I went, got to that pit. I got to the other side, drained the water out of my boots, took my socks off, wrung them out, got it as dry as I could, put my stuff back on. I knew I would be okay. Why? Because of past experiences. Because I've been wet before, getting soakers in the swamp during hunting season. I know that if as long as that temperature is above 30, 35 degrees, I'm able to sit in a stand still with soaking wet feet uh, because my boots will insulate that water and keep me warm. I know I can do it. But when you start getting down to below freezing temperatures, 32, you know, 30, 28, if I get a soaker, I need to immediately turn around and go change or I won't be able to stay on stand long enough to hunt. So I know to go back and change. These are things you learn from experiences. I knew I would be just fine going across that water, getting soaked, getting that pig, coming back, and I knew it from past experiences. Things that you learn by becoming a student of the woods, a student of the things that happen to you, a student of your time in the field. These are things that you use. And when I laid it out and broke it down to my wife on why I did it, it this isn't I wasn't asking myself these questions when I was doing it. I just already knew the answers. But when she asked me and I explained it to her like that, not only was her, in her mind, her doing the math and calculating this, I was also going, huh, it's amazing I put all that stuff together right then. But I guess I did because that's what I did. And, and now I'm explaining why I did it. It's pretty interesting. And it goes to show you what you're capable of when you have that knowledge. And the only way to get the knowledge is to ask the how and why and soak every extract every piece of information from every single experience you have out there that's what makes you a true woodsman that's what makes you a great hunter that's what makes you consistently successful in the field that's what does everything there's no shortcuts there's no cheating there's no beating the learning curve it is just experience after experience and what you do with those experiences and how you extract the information from them always be extracting information from the good and from the bad there you go. We're going to end this episode right there. Hope you got a lot out of it. I'll be back again with another one next week. Talk to you later. Bye. 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 Talk to you later. Bye.